This is Jason Reed Pratt, author of Cry of Justice. Have you ever needed to learn how to... Uh, wait, I've done this joke in Episode Zero already. Um, in Episode Zero, I introduced the board game Churchill from GMT Games. If you don't know what I'm talking about yet, you should probably go watch that. This is Episode One, where having already set up the game, I'm going to start it. I'll be explaining how to play as I go along, and also learning how to play, because I have literally never played it before. So if you are like me, and I know I am, you too will be an absolute newbie at this game. And if you are not, well, you can laugh at me trying to learn it. In case you're too lazy busy to watch Episode Zero, Churchill is a game for three players, each acting as the characters of Joseph Stalin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and later Truman if the game goes long enough for FDR to die, and Winston Churchill, as they hash out among themselves the best way for one of them to have more political influence in the world after they beat the Axis powers in World War II. The stage, and the table, and the game board, is set. The time, January 1943. The situation. The Japanese Empire stands at high tide, with expansion north as far as Nomahan, in Soviet territory, west as far as Burma, and east as far as the Solomon Islands and the Marshall Islands. The United States currently holds the honor of overall Pacific Theater Command, but both the United Kingdom in the China-India-Burma Theater and the United States in the Central and Southwest Pacific Theaters are prepared to lead with cooperation from each other on the offensives to push back the Empire. The Soviets must work by themselves, more or less, and have other things to worry about, but could start their own drive to Japan, in theory. They also have the least distance to travel. Note the little blue circles with white anchors. Those mean that, in order for a front to have any chance of advancing into those squares, at least three units of naval support must be gathered together. You should also notice that the Soviets only need such naval support for the final step into the Japanese home islands by their route. The tide is poised to turn, and not only here in the Pacific against the Japanese Empire. Here in the European theater, the Soviet Union has finally amassed enough troops with enough new technology and experience to begin the long punchback from the Don River across Eastern Europe. The Nazi regime is already being challenged by the Western Allies in North Africa with a special British focus there, although the campaign has yet to be settled. The German Navy controls the North Sea, including the Baltics for southern Norway and Finland, much more so the western continental mainland of Fortress Europe. Italy, with help from Germany, guards the southern approach. The United States is concentrating more of its weight on the north than the south, but for now, Great Britain carries the honor of overall European theater command. This jockeying of the honor of overall command is unique to the U.S. and the U.K. Stalin over there is in bloody, grim, and murderous command of his own drives, thank you very much. Also, he doesn't need naval support at all to march into Berlin but he'll gladly take advantage of and promote naval support in the Arctic theater for his own production purposes. In theory, all the scoring happens at the end of the game. In practice, players sometimes track the potential score, which is why in Episode Zero, while setting up the game, I gave the United Kingdom 10 points. They receive points when the colonies in Asia are clean of any influence one way or another, two per colony. And that's how the game starts. To be honest, some of those colonial interests on the map were French, not British. But the game is the game, so there. Yeah. In between episodes, I have also added three points each to the USSR and the UK again. Why? Because the United States lost some significant political honor when they were driven out of the Philippines. If Douglas MacArthur does not return before the end of the war, the UK and USSR will look stronger by comparison. And so, since he isn't there, their points are active, for now. I'm keeping a printed score track for each turn over here at my script that I'm reading from at this very moment! So, at the end of the game, I'll know what I've already accounted for. I'll also keep track of the score at the end of episodes. There are some bits of setup and adjustment I've forgotten due to newness, which in hindsight I'll get to later. 
Also, due to the way I ended up cutting the audio and footage together, I won't have any sound effects from here on out in this episode. I'll try to do something about that on future reps. Before every conference, each player is dealt out their standard production chips. These reset at the start of each turn, and they're always the same. A stack of six for the United States. I'll get around later to spreading them out so they're easier to see. A stack of four for the United Kingdom, and then a stack of three for the USSR. Because of Stalin's inherently terrible communist policies hobbling his ultra-large nation. That done, we're off to the conference deck. I flip the deck over, revealing... Alternate History C for the first conference, codename symbol, held in Casablanca. A scan down the text shows me no inactive leaders. I'll set all leaders to active. Historically, Stalin refused to leave Moscow except for Tehran and Yalta. He wouldn't go any farther away than that. The game does account for leaders being absent, or dead, but, for balance purposes, pretends the leaders more often showed up. There isn't a Casablanca version where Stalin doesn't attend, for example. Every conference card features short and sometimes confusing instructions, which almost be followed next, top to bottom in order, even if the effort will be wasted. Green is UK, it's Churchill's game, he often goes first, and for this version of January 1943, Britain has committed to the Arakan campaign. Therefore, Winston must devote at least one chip of production to the Burma front. Germany sends some reinforcements to the air fleet operating out of captured Norway, so the occasional Murmansk convoy might be sunk. The convoy has been already running for years and keeps on going throughout the war. A 50-50 chance on the die, and it fills with a six. Drat. No convoy this time. Thanks to political pressure, FDR must align two of his production chips to one of the two Pacific fronts. I can put one on both or either front, but I can decide that later. The gray block refers to special access events before the conference. This one means the Allies have lost the invasion of Guadalcanal, so that particular front can't move at all for us this turn. Well, that actually tells me, as FDR, where to put those two production chips over in the Central Pacific. The final block on the card represents actions of minor nations in the path of the fronts, where groups are setting up partisan networks favorable to an ally. Every player receives, this time, two random partisan actions in his favor, with an even chance for three instead. Each of these actions directly affects the score. Because it's his game, ha, huh, Churchill gets the first roll. Six. So he gets three networks. These are assigned according to two more dice on this table. Five and five. That's Romania. Stalin won't like that. <laughs> uh, whoops, left the tabletop simulator interface on for a while. Sorry. Now that you've seen how this works, I'm going to speed things along by quickly showing the chips being placed, not the dice rolls. Britain gets one in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> uh, weird, in this game, Czech is a western front territory. Shouldn't that be east? Well, Denmark makes sense where it is. Stalin's round. Rolls a five from four to six. He also gets three. One pops up in Siam, one of Churchill's colonial interests. Two and five is Greece, meanwhile. Hmm. I think these clandestine chips are too large for the board. One of the many great things about Tabletop Simulator. I can resize most of the pieces, so I'll just take a few minutes off script doing that, and... Bam! Ta-da! Stalin's final goes in three, five, the DEI. DEI? Oh, Dutch each... Bleh. Dutch East Indies! DEI stands for duh, extra ignorant. Another colony. Bahahaha. Last, the U.S. rolls. Phew, he barely lucked out, but also gets three. The first roll goes to Norway, and there his luck quickly ends. Norway cannot get partisans, much less political influence. Not until someone has lent them three naval support. This is the start of the game. No naval support there yet, so that chip is wasted. Vip. His second one goes to Greece, and now we have a new rule. Different partisan groups will fight each other, so placing one on top of one negates them both. Vip. The secret war is beginning already. The U.S. does get to place one network in Persia, and that ends this part of the turn. Now we adjust the score. Three new networks support the U.K., so their score goes up by three. Two supported Stalin, and that gives him two points. But they popped up in colonies. And that deducts two points, times two, for Churchill, since Britain would rather see colonies free from any tampering. Church can still fix this later. Only one new network for FDR, so he gets one point. And now he doesn't have zero! Ha! One last thing before the conference can start. Each player shuffles his staff member deck and draws seven. 
This is an example. I won't show it for all the players, nor on future eps. Normally, each player would now check over their staff cards and carefully strategize about who they want to sacrifice this turn to set the agenda. Each person has different abilities, but those mean nothing at this stage, except a person used to set the agenda will not be able to use his or her, for America sometimes, abilities later. Since I'm completely unfamiliar with the game, I'm going to randomly draw this time. Maybe later too, but eh, I'll play it by ear on future turns. Flip the cards over, and huh, George C. Marshall. He's a chief of staff. Each player gets a chief of staff, and they're strong politically. So much so that they can vary turn by turn in how much they care to support what their leader is doing. In game terms, that means the little star gets replaced with a random die between 1 and 6. And he rolls a 3. Nice hustle, George. Way to give the agenda away. He needed a 5 or 6 because Britain's staff is so skilled at centuries of politics that their strength goes up by 1 during this phase. Oliver Littleton, Minister of Production up there, actually has an adjusted strength of 5. That means Britain sets the agenda, and we'll see what that means in a minute. I'll put a marker on Marshall to set his strength for now, and if you see a yellow marker on Churchill up there, I made that because my short-term memory is terrible, so it reminds me who won the initiative this turn, so to speak. What happens in the agenda phase? We just started it. Churchill won it. So now what happens? Each player nominates topics, also called conference issues. As you can see, there are several. There aren't several of each chip. There are several polymill chips, for example, but not more than one of each type. Let's talk about these on the left first. These are called conditional issues, and these are the only two. The second front represents the Normandy invasion, which will force the Nazis to take a lot of pressure off Stalin's advance. The other allies wanted to give it to Stalin since 41, but first they had to spool up the speed and Britain was fighting alone already in Africa and the Middle East. Back on November 6, the 42, the U.S. kicked the into Africa with Operation Torch, helping Britain to roll back Rommel's Africa Corps, which, by the way, is why Casablanca is free to hold a conference in at all. But that still isn't the push that Stalin wants, and to be fair, he needs. Nor for this game is there any debate about southern France or Italy being the second front. It has to be Normandy. But, to even try launching into Normandy, all three allies must agree together that it's time. So someone has to nominate the second front as a topic, and then it must end the conference in the middle of the table. But also, unless and until the West Europe front can win the Battle of the Atlantic, also known as Operation Bolero, there isn't any point to even nominating a second front. That's why this is a conditional issue. Conditions must be triggered first. Similar conditions must be met before the USSR will declare a war on Japan. Stalin can move up one space on the Far East Front, if he wants to try, but he can't even try to invade into Manchuria without a similar equal agreement from all the players that it's time for him to do so. The topic has to be nominated, and it has to end the turn in the middle of the table. And he has to be in position first. Either way, if an invasion fails, the topic will have to be broached and agreed upon later to try again. But once an invasion succeeds, it can be treated as off the table. Those two issues are two of the three that need to be center table to work. We'll get to the third in a minute. All the rest give benefits only if a leader ends the conference with the topic on their track. Middle of the table will otherwise neutralize the topic. A-bomb research. In order for anyone to move up on the research track, this has to be a nominated topic. Britain partially benefits by the U.S. eventually getting the bomb, but naturally the U.S. benefits more, potentially. Stalin naturally benefits if the Western Allies don't get nuclear bombs during the war. In fact, I'll adjust his potential score later to reflect this mental note. If Stalin wins this topic, that means his spy network gets to move up a notch, possibly even ahead of Western research. This also instantly gives him three extra victory points each time he wins the topic, for a total of 12, potentially, while the Western Allies won't get any until they reach the Trinity Test. But, regardless of who wins it, the U.S. still gets a chance to roll for a chance to advance and send some production to help it. The A-bomb can only be used against Japan if Western fronts have moved into areas marked with B-29. This counts as one of the things which, added up, leads the Japanese Emperor to surrender. We're a long way from that. Global issues. This is a catch-all term for what the shape of the world will be like after the war. 
Whoever wins the topic can move a pawn between himself and the other characters toward himself. Or away, I suppose, if he thinks that's more in his favor somehow. This opens up, or locks out, or otherwise hampers, where players can place political chips. It never affects the partisan network placement. Strategic Materials Whoever wins this topic gets one chip of extra production, but if it ends in the center, everyone gets some extra. No one gets any more extra production for winning it, but winning it would help keep down another player's score. Pacific and European Theater Leadership This is mainly a Roosevelt-Churchill topic. Whoever wins this topic gets some extra offensive and or naval support this turn, and whoever holds them at the start of a turn gets some extra too, regardless of whether the topics are debated. Winning both topics in the same term generates extra military support beyond even that. Production. One British production ship, and two USA, can be put up for grabs in the conference. If someone other than the flag on the ship wins the topic, they get that production to help themselves this turn. If the nation with the flag wins it, or if it ends in the middle, that nation keeps its production for itself. Dedicated fronts, on the other hand, force a nation to spend a production on a particular front. This doesn't generate extra production. It only means the nation who wins its discussion can make the flag on the chip devote resources to a front of the winner's choice. So, for example, if the U.S. wins the Soviet flag, the U.S. could put it on Normandy, and so make Stalin assign some production to helping the offense there. But the U.S. could also put it on one of Stalin's own fronts. Why bother? To make sure Stalin won't be spending that production point on something else. The final group over there are poly-milli topics. Whoever wins these gets the option to assign their own production to setting up partisan networks somewhere and or political influence. That doesn't happen for free. It still needs production to fuel the growth, but it's one of the few ways of getting a choice in how to grow those things directly, and they convert straight to victory points. These are the Cold War chips in effect. I won't be discussing all this in detail again for future reps, so later things will move a lot faster. So, to the agenda ing. Churchill won the agenda, so he gets to choose the first topic. Everyone, including Churchill, or whoever sets the agenda, then will get to choose another two more topics each, running clockwise around the board, seven topics total every conference. Most of the topics can always be discussed again at every conference. Who the allies each have picked from their staff, however, to set the agenda directly affects how strongly each player will introduce each topic. We'll see that in a minute. Churchill has three productions currently, plus one more that his conference event has already assigned to the Indian Front. <laughs> I, don't, I cannot do Churchill at all. About the closest I can do is Sean Connery playing Churchill. <laughs> so, yeah, Sean Connery playing Churchill. Let's, let's try that. I'd like a little more production if I can swing it. And uh, Oh, right. Speaking of extra production, whoever controls the total theater at the start of a turn gets one offensive or one naval support that he can place anywhere he wants in that overall theater. This is regardless of who ends up with theater commands at the end of any conference. This is an easy choice for FDR. <laughs> now I get to try my FDR voices, my various voices. I'm... <clears throat> I'm going to take one naval, because the Central Pacific Front has got to have at least three naval supports to start advancing in the Central Pacific later. As Churchill, it's harder for me to decide early whether I should take a naval or an offensive. I'll just make a note that I get one or the other support later after the conference. It would be to my advantage to discuss picking up Pacific theater leadership too. The U.S. can spam naval and offensive support for themselves regardless of whether they are leading anything. But we have fewer industrial production to work with. By the same token, it would be to everyone's advantage to put strategic production on the table. But here comes a quirk. Whatever my staff officer down there nominates will be nominated so strongly that it will start well up my track. The formula is a staff officer's adjusted strength, five for this fellow thanks to Britain's agenda power, Minus the weakest staff member's strength, two for the Soviet chap, means the topic starts three whole notches up my side of the table. That's great for me, as Churchill, except for things like strategic production, which really need to end in the center agreed on by everyone. So hopefully someone else will nominate, maybe Stalin's delegate, since whatever he nominates this turn, as the weakest proposing topics, will be center table. 
That being the case, what do I most want to start as safely as possible toward me? Well, Pacific Theater leadership. The next person clockwise is Stalin, who can now choose two agendas, except these two, because there's no point in doing them yet. Whatever topic my staff advances this turn will start in the center. That being the case, I'll choose strategic materials, since that benefits everyone by ending, and so starting, in the middle. And then... Nothing else benefits by starting in the middle, or nothing that makes any sense to discuss, not yet. I need production more than anything, and I can get a semi-permanent production boost by sprucing up the naval support in the Arctic. I can't do that from the conference directly, but if I nominate some U.S. production for discussion, maybe I'll end up diverting one of his chips over here. Over to the U.S. As FDR, General Marshall isn't too keen to support me right now, so his 3 minus the Soviet 2 means anything he nominates will only be notch 1. If it comes to that, the European Theater Command would offset Winston's attempt at taking away my leadership in the PTO. A bomb research is important too, and the sooner the better. Better pull those two out now then. Finally, Churchill gets to put the last two out there. But because I'm stupid and an absolute newbie, I forget that he can nominate two more topics, so I only nominate one, global issues. I can't go back and fix it either, so that's how this turn will play. Certainly the other two guys won't pipe up and give Churchill a chance to put a third topic high in his own initial favor. The first staff people tap off the board. They can't be played for the rest of this conference, and not the next time either. The agendas have been set. Time to discuss them. Who does the discussing? The other six staff officers we dealt out to ourselves earlier. Before I flip over Stalin's staff, though, I have to roll some dice for Stalin's murderous paranoia. The game won't let him kill any of them. Not this way. But he might go crazy and reduce their strength by one for this turn. Although, not less than one before bonuses. Rolled an eight, so everyone's fine. Two to four total, that would be bad. Pretty strong. Not bad. Some get buffs and debuffs, because I'm active here at the conference. I'm using some dice to show the adjusted strength. Gosh, I can kind of do his voice in FDR. It's Churchill I'm having trouble with. <laughs> the cards are printed a bit unclearly. It looks like it says, if production is an issue, but what it means is, if this card is played on the production issue. Similarly, if this guy is played on the strategic material issue, and... If that issue is on an opponent's track, then he gets plus three strength for a total of four. He's pretty useless otherwise, and it isn't likely someone will move the strategic production issue off the center. Anyway, the player clockwise of who won the agenda gets to go first in discussing issues, and that's Stalin, which is why I was prepping his staff. Stalin's active for this conference, so he himself can also advance topics. And... One of my major abilities is that if I myself step in to advance the A-bomb topic, no one else can debate it. I just get to move it, and that's the end of my round, period. Which I'm darn well going to do, as they say in American cowboy movies, because I hugely benefit if I win this topic. For a leader himself to step in, one of the staff officers has to step aside, discard it, and uh, the sheep is probably useless, so sit down, does Vidania to him. Now I'm moving a bomb research by my steely Russian strength, seven spaces. Well, that completely failed. Doom, 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 doom. There. Yeah. Now if I had managed to pull this topic one step further, I would have captured it, and there could be no further discussion on it for this conference. And so Stalin is done. He's tapped out, kind of discarded. He can still come the next time to the next conference, depending on what the conference says. But he's no longer active for this conference. Unfortunately, I'm ignorant. I kept dice buffs and debuffs as if tapped out leaders were active until the end of the whole turn when I suddenly realized I should have deactivated those leaders and removed the alternatives. So if you know the game and you see me doing something wrong here, that's why. Fortunately, in hindsight, I don't think it matters, but we'll see. Over to FDR's staff for their first round. Uh, whoops, left the tabletop simulator user interface on for a while there. 
This is a very decent draw with Roosevelt active, Special Envoy Averell Merriman leading the pack, who gets a strong boost for some reason if Churchill is active. And then <laughs> the Postmaster General, what does he have to do with anything? But if FDR is active, he goes up to strength four, which is nothing to sneeze at. Now, it would be nice to get that A-bomb research back from Stalin. I can still use it if anyone wins it, but Stalin and his spies will get extra points over there. What else am I concerned about? If U.S. production moves off the center, ditto strategic production, although with my production strength, losing that one won't be such a big deal as for others, I am going to care about this. I might care about that, and I'll care about the ETO, but I've already got that for now. The PTO will be my prime focus, followed at no great distance by nerfing Stalin's A-bomb spying and then other things if they move around. I don't have anyone specially capable of getting the PTO off Winston's track, but I do have a good bench, and they can probably do it if they focus. The only hope for freedom and democracy is... That's the worst FDR ever. <laughs> can I get the A-bomb spying neutralized too? Not sure. One of my staff especially weak against the Stalin track? Well, since I'm active, what's my special power? I can debate the global issue strongly, but if I'm used for anything, there's a chance I'll outright die. I'll save that risk for later. Even though I think I care most about the PTO, I might need to pull the A-bomb topic back, and fast, before Stalin puts it in. The difference comes to this. Churchill will also want the bomb spying defused, so I'm going to bet Winston will work on that too, starting on his first round. That being the case, I'm going to lead with my big gun merry man. Churchill's friend, enemy, admirer, frenemy. He'll pull the A-bomb topic back to Stalin 1. Yeah, unless someone debates him. Remember I said that Stalin's special power was that no one can debate him on the A-bomb question? Well, debating means one, and only one of the other pl other two players can also play a card on the topic. This is the A-bomb topic, and FDR is advancing it, but someone can debate him on that. <laughs> Churchill gets the first opportunity clockwise from Roosevelt, but he sure doesn't want to stop this. So will Stalin debate it? Well, he can't debate it personally by playing a card. I've tapped him out already. If he has a staff officer with power six, he can get that topic back up and even home at Stalin's chair. Now here I have to remind viewers that I'm an absolute newbie, and so I haven't deactivated Stalin after playing him. So this guy, Clement Voroshilov, member of the high command, should really be strength five. But the Soviets have a special global buffing power during debates called Nyet, a vigorous no. Any Soviet card playing d played during debate of an advancement gets plus one. So as it happens, this move still works. The net result of, five, of minus five plus one, or strictly speaking, minus five minus one for a minus six, plus Britain's plus five, which um, pulled it back, is that the A-bomb topic does get pulled, after all, to Stalin's chair. Now it's off the table, and so cannot be discussed again at this conference. No one else was strong enough to pull this off, even with an yet, so Comrade Clement was still the right choice. Because he chose to debate, when Stalin's turn comes back around, he can opt to pass in order to spare his cards for later. There's a marker for this, which the rules suggest I play on my discard pile, obviously under Clement, but later I'll move it somewhere more convenient. Churchill time! He himself is active, so he can play his special power. Like FDR, he's good on the global issue, which also, like FDR, creates a free polymarker. And unlike FDR, he gets this bonus even if the global is on his own track, or in the middle. Also like FDR, if I use Churchill for anything, he might have a heart attack. But unlike FDR, he won't die from it, only be inactive for the rest of the conference. On the other hand, he pulled a kind of weak bench with a couple of old dudes who really might straight up die when they're played. Although there are a couple of ways around that, like using them on the agenda round, or subbing in the leader. So, Church. <laughs> that rascal Franklin. If I don't get the ETO to my side, I'll only be switching out commands. Now that both have been nominated on the agenda, though, whoever can win them both will get some extra extra bonuses. So that's a consideration. 
As long as strategic production is in the middle, I don't care. Picking up some U.S. production from FDR would be nice, but putting the PTO to bed is a major priority. The global issue would be nice if I can get it, but it might be better as a distraction for other players. The bomb is off the table. Stalin won't try to capture the PTO for himself. I should also consider I'm ahead on conference topics by having two leaning my way. I should focus on keeping that lead. Hmm. As it happens, I've a rather puny fellow here, Sir Andrew Cunningham, who... Wait, he is also the sea first sea lord? He must have taken over when the other guy died historically, unless there can be two first sea lords. Yeah. Back to Churchill. He's stronger if he's played on ETO leadership change. Oh, honestly, I'm not sure what that means. It sounds vaguely specific. If ETO is discussed at all, it would be for change of leadership, so why specify change in the card text? I may have to check the Erata list later, since I didn't think to do it in-game. For want of clarifying the vagary now, I decide it means if Britain currently leads the ETO, and if the ETO is on another player's track, threatening change from Britain's lead. Both qualify. And he isn't much good for anything else. Play him! I doubt Stalin will bother debating it. Which, putting on my Stalin hat. It's true, I don't care. Let them burn cards sorting it out. FDR staff doesn't get any special pluses or minuses for this situation. Yeah, my FDR voice is also terrible, but not as bad as Churchill's. The question is, should I block it? Well, I'm not altogether sure I can get the PTO back from Churchill, so this is my ace if I can't. And clearly, he'll be distracted by it rather than putting the PTO away, so... Yes, I'll block hard with the Postmaster General! Ha ha ha! Take that, Winston. I'm sicking the post office on you. Four goes this way, four goes back, no move. Send the staff to the discard, I'll get an option to pass on my next turn, and onward to Stalin. I nominated the U.S. production, hoping to pick it up, and Allo, Anastas Mikoyan, my Minister of War and Trade. He goes to strength four if he's played on production, so sure, put him in. Come at me, rolling capitalist dog pigs. Yeah, I love doing his voice. <laughs> Now, does Roosevelt's squad intend to debate that? Why, I have a Secretary of Labor lady, Frances Perkins, who buffs up to strength five on production issues. I expect in real life, Lady Frances Perkins over there was one of those people heavily responsible for stomping the axis into the ground because she kept the workers up for the monstrously huge and technically proficient United States war effort, largely thanks to women stepping up to production on the home front. Quite apt, then, that she pulls U.S. production all the way back past center to U.S. 1. It doesn't help us there, but we're trying to keep from losing it. Good job, Lady Perkins. Stalin declined his free pass and wasted a guy for less than no result. Not a good round for him. Tap both those staff members out, and it's FDR's turn again. <clears throat> I may have been too busy this conference. I've only got one, two, three staff cards left. And the PTO hasn't been secured yet. Churchill still has five staff. Stalin has three. The thing is, if Stalin and I run out, Churchill can spam staff cards to put in whatever he wants to. But the PTO isn't secured yet. If I leave it alone, he's likely to realize he was silly not to bring it home when he could. Okay, this guy. Attorney General Francis Biddle is weak when the Soviets have taken the lead on a topic, so I'll play him here. I'll make Winston at least burn cards for it. I am absolutely going to debate this. John Anderson, Lord President of the Council, not only has a nice strength of four, which should improve my position, but on a die roll of one, I'll get two offensive support markers. I either win the debate or I more win the debate. Ha! Uh, right, what is Stalin going to focus on? Probably U.S. production and the global issue. So, yes. I feel safe burning this strong card to improve my position. Roll the six-sided die. Drat. No extra offense, but I've nothing lost. I think I'm going to start putting the pass card on top of the active slot marker where it's easier to remember. Also, I don't have to move it every time I send cards to the discard.
Not that it matters. Churchill isn't going to pass. <laughs> I'm going to get that global issue home, at least, sacrificing Sir Dudley Pound, who's weak in this situation and has half a chance of dying anyway to advance the issue myself. I have less than half a chance of being inconvenienced by a heart attack. I then spend a few minutes debating whether Stalin or FDR will send someone to debate Churchill on this, because I have not yet understood that only a leader can debate another leader, and Stalin already tapped out already. But I decide not to bother, because Churchill's opponents only have a few cards left anyway, and this early in the game they wouldn't be hurt by either of Winston's choices if he wins. And if I debated using FDR, he could time bomb out with a stroke. So, boom, global issues go home. But I've still got to roll for Winston's heart attack risks. Whew, a six. He failed between two and four. And happened to roll a two and a four, but they add up to six. Churchill taps out, whereupon again I don't realize I'm supposed to set him to inactive. I <laughs> oh God, I love Stalin's voice. <laughs> Back to Stalin. I'm certainly not passing my turn, but who to send in? Eh, it doesn't matter. I'm just fighting for U.S. production. Though the end of the conference is approaching, and I only have a score of one topic to there, too, so moving that production topic over here will tie me with Winston and nerf FDR. Go forth, Alexander Vasilovsky, Chief of the General Staff of the Red Army. Get us that production from America. Yeah, does anyone say yet to that? I'm not going to say no to that. I want to, but I need to secure the PTO. Ditto for Churchill. Well done, vassal sun guy. And also, from your card ability, generate your comrades some support offense in... Wait, really? The Far East Theater? Yeah, I won't spit on free offensive support. Roosevelt's round. Now I need to seriously think if I'm going to pass, but I don't dare pass. Winston can put the PTO away and still have a chance at taking the ETO, too. So, Harold Eccles, Secretary of the Interior, go get in there. That puts the PTO in the center. Fine with me. Anyone care to debate this? This, by the way, is when I realized that tapped-out leaders are inactive and their modifiers to staff officers should disappear. Conveniently, I remembered this while I was playing FDR's round who is not tapped out. <laughs> As Churchill, I won't debate using Sir John Dill yet, since FDR might yet pull the PTO onto his track and he'd be better there. So, <clears throat> Sir John Tovey, Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet, get that PTO back to UK too. He doesn't have a relevant card power, so discard everyone, put up the pass reminder, and move along to the UK. Hmm. I'd better give Franklin something more to worry about. If I take Sir Hastings Ismay, who's still a strong four even without being active myself, I can pull at the ETO. And what's Franklin going to do? Blow his last card debating this. <clears throat> I get the first chance at debating now, and Winston, you are currently ahead of the conference with three topics. I don't have to sit idle. <laughs> On the other hand, it's fun to watch them scrabble and tire each other out. I graciously pass opportunity to troll you till a more opportune time. Well, that sounded ominous. <clears throat> but as FDR, am I going to take my two and... Well, debating the ETO with that would be pointless. Winston would still be UK1. Fine, I won't debate it. <laughs> they have both one card left, and I have two. One way or another, I get final say. How to do it? Eh, I haven't debated since my round, so I can't pass. So I do have to play, but on what? Ah, you see. I passed debating on the ETO, so I could yank the PTO they've been tugging onto me. Cavalry Inspector of Red Army, charge! He's surprisingly good at debating, as long as I'm not active. Then he gets nervous. Now I am, as they say, trolling you both. I shall be one who decide to run Pacific Theater. <laughs> Do anyone want to debate me on this? Well, I don't know what Winston's other card is, only that he's got one. And mine is too weak to debate this effectively. If Stalin keeps it, 
And there's at least a 50-50 chance he gives it back to me since he can't really use it. So, pass. <laughs> My last card is a chap who could just drop dead. But he's a strong four. That would be enough to get the PTO back to me. Yes, I'll do it. Whereupon I forget this guy has a half chance to die. I'll try to remember to adjust for this before turn two next episode. FDR's turn. Wow, Churchill should have left it there and used his final card on something else. There was a half chance Stalin would give it to him after all. Now I'm going to pull it back to me with my little two-point guy with the huge title I forgot to read and can't squint at while making this audio. I can't believe it! I'm going to pull this out after all! Yet, not so fast, fellow socialist running dog lackey. I have card to debate with, even though he does not. I do not even need to use Soviet yet, but I will. Soviet bias, one point advantage in debate. That surprise twist, the conference ends. No more staff cards to play. All topics on tracks go to their chairs, and the Soviet Union won the debate with three topics claimed. The first thing that happens is, Stalin gets five points for winning the conference. Either of the other two would have won three points, since there's a reasonable assumption they will be more likely to cooperate against Stalin than with Stalin against each other. In this case, they fought mostly against each other, and Stalin was the one who benefited. Also, Stalin sometimes have to, has to compete against his own murderous paranoia, scaring his staff members. But not this time. No directed offense topics and no conditional topics were discussed, so no need to resolve those. A U.S. production was discussed, and Stalin won that, so he gets one of the U.S. production ships. Strategic materials. Everyone agreed on that, so everyone gets to use their strategic materials. Yay, everyone gets plus one. After all players have received their production, and they have for this turn, all players starting clockwise of the winner of the conference, which is me, <laughs> must place all their production somewhere, including with priorities. FDR first, then. The pre-conference events already made me assign to production to the Central Pacific Theater. So, these four are free to go. I can't allocate those to political chips or partisan chips because none of those were debated. I can allocate to A-bomb research, but I'll see how much I want to put elsewhere first. I can't roll that research yet until Stalin's turn, unfortunately, because he won that topic. I've already picked up my naval offense chips for starting the turn leading the PTO. And I already decided to put that chip here, in the Central Pacific Front. I can't go anywhere here in the South Pacific yet because we lost Guadalcanal and had to evacuate. Consequently, any further production I put in the Pacific, I should send it to the Central Front. I mean, I could send it to Russia's or Britain's front, but I'll get more potential victory points advancing the Blue Front. But maybe I should put some production in Europe. Notice that the Mediterranean theater is never going to advance into Germany. See, the line doesn't connect to it. Winston and I would still get points for advancing on either European front, but I'll get more by pushing east. Any of those fronts can enter Japan, by the way. This particular front, the CBI front, China, Burma, India, the U.S. probably won't support it a lot because Britain gets more points by moving along this way. That's why this front is green. Similarly, the UK probably won't support the Central and Southwest Pacific fronts because the US gets more points than the UK by those routes. After every conference, each front, like this one, must make a shot at moving. You know what? I I'm going to rotate all these so the text is more readable. O O C D, no O D C. How could I ever bore people as effectively without you? So, for this example, according to this version of 1943, the Southwest front is going nowhere. Its naval support won't go away between turns, but any offensive support I give it, as FDR or any of the players, would be wasted. If this thing doesn't have enough naval support to fight Bolero, it's also going nowhere. But it needs offensive support as well as navy support. You may have noticed I moved the two gray squares from Germany to Japan. Those are navy forces, and Japan has more of them. I placed them wrong earlier. The German Navy is almost whacked out by January 43, but it'll still be fighting for a while. Anyway, I must put two production here for some purpose. I might as well convert both of those to Navy support. The Japanese Navy might or might not oppose me here, so it's better to have some Naval Reserve support just in case. With four total here, I'll be good later. I need Navy support built up in North Europe too, so I'll convert to production, eh, I'll convert three. 
to bring up three naval support there too. That leaves me over one production, which I will assign to A-bomb research when it's time. I'll be keeping the ETO next time, but I started with it this time. That means I get either one of offensive support or naval support, which I hadn't decided on before now. I'll pull offensive support to get ready to fight in North Africa. Now, while the ETO didn't change hands, it was debated, and I did win it. So, having won the issue, I can receive two more support, naval or offensive, that I can place anywhere in the whole theater. Even help Stalin if I want. But obviously, I'm putting those in the southern front for the North Africa campaign, too. Now, I could spend any of my remaining production helping FDR research the A-bomb, but we've got plenty of time for A-bombing, and I want to get an early lead on Franklin marching troops. So I'll split my remaining four production to get equal offensive forces at the Burma Front and North Africa. To Stalin's production. He won the PTO leadership, so he gets two supports, which he can use anywhere he wants. We know Germany is going to send a lot of power to keep me from moving, because Normandy hasn't opened yet. So I'm dang well going to put that production to extra offense at my European front. And I don't really care who controls which front yet. It might matter later to nerf one side's points or the other, but to keep them balanced out on potential points, I'll give it back to the US. Stalin also triggers the A-bomb research. As long as it's on the table, and as long as someone wins it, the U.S. gets to research it. And this is where FDR will spend his last production this turn. Normally, he'll win on a 4-6, to six, but with a point of production, now it's a roll of 3-6. to six. And never mind, it's a natural 6 for the win. He wasted that production. FDR advances to Oak Ridge. No victory points for the Western Allies on this yet, but since Stalin won the topic, he gets to move his spy ring one step forward regardless, and he does get three victory points instantly for doing so. He also gets three points because the West doesn't have the A-bomb yet, which I haven't accounted for yet, but I'm about to. Stalin just took the lead. He's got 16 points currently. Oh, that was dumb. Now that I look at it, Stalin still has five production he can use anywhere on the map. Gotta do that first. Well, since I've got a bunch, now would be a good time to try for an overrun on the Eastern Front. I need a net strength of 10 to get an automatic overrun, and I know the Nazis will be fronting me with at least 4 armies. So I need a total of 14 strength at least. 2 per basic front, plus 2 for each offensive support. Can I do it? No, not quite, but I can put up a lot. And I might as well load up my Far East Theater and get to Nomahan. So 5 there and five in Eastern Europe, all my production troops go back to the stack. Now it's time for military. The first part of the military phase, we put the clandestine markers, with the person who has the most going first, but we all have equal numbers, namely one. So the US uses my tiebreaker ability as the arsenal of democracy to say, I go first. This early in the game, the most benefit goes to putting partisans in the colonies, because that also knocks out two points from Winston. FDR gains a point. Now he has two! And tap back Churchill for two. By the same token as Winston, I can burn one of Joe's networks in the colonies, reducing Stalin by one and gaining me two back, because that colony is free of influence now. Stalin says, Yeah, no, that's going back yet. Gotta beat colonialism. So that was a push between me and Churchill, taking the score nowhere. Uh, political markers? Nobody has any. Now it's time for what? Wait, no, I should have done global issues first. Uh, Winston won that. And global issues don't affect clandestine networks. But since everyone is ragging on colonialism, I can move the pawn that way to protect the colonies better in the future. Now can we do what? First, the Axis has to surge its reserves, starting with Germany. Oh, uh, Ark! In hindsight, Stalin should have bought some naval support and put it in the Arctic theater to get some semi-permanent production. That was my plan the whole time, and I completely forgot. I'll blame Stalin's insane paranoia, maybe, yeah. Okay, no one is trying to enter Germany. They'll always surge at least one army towards Stalin. German Navy Reserve goes to the Western Theater Box to remove one naval marker. Normandy hasn't been invaded, so another four German armies get put in Russia at the Don River. No need to put reserves in West Europe yet, 
Italy goes to North Africa, since they haven't been crushed out of the war yet. And since we have one remaining German army, roll for its random deployment. With a fresh new dried blood dye I just created. Two, it goes into the Western Front, even though the West doesn't need that defense yet. That's a waste. But that's how things go. That front can't even advance without sufficient naval support, which the Nazi Navy just nerfed. Down to the Pacific. The Imperial Collapse has not started yet. No fronts are entering Japan. Russia hasn't moved into the Far Eastern Theater yet. No one is entering a B-29 space. The Imperial Navy still has two reserves, which don't get deployed at the same time. On a roll of one to two, one of them will get placed. But they don't. The four reserve armies get randomly distributed now by die roll. Central Pacific into the Marshall Islands. Burma, Marshall Islands again, and the Solomon Islands, which is a waste this turn. But accidentally it kind of fits. I mean, we lost Guadalcanal in this version of the war. Now to resolve the battles. This front can go nowhere because the German Navy punched the Allies. Eastern Front, 12 offensive power minus 10 defensive equals 2. Got to roll 2 or less. Ouch. Stalin says, Duh! This deal is not mushy. Over the dawn, my fellow Russian heroes. Gould Soviet citizens. The offensive power gets used up. German armies back to the assignment box next time. Southwestern Pacific Theater can't move due to the card event. Central Pacific Theater. I have the naval support, but no offensive support. My basic front strength of two can't even begin to overcome the Japanese Army Defense of four, so good job, Empire. You keep me out of the marshals this turn. Naval support never automatically goes away, so we'll see about this next time. Far Eastern Front. Stalin was dumb here. I assigned more than ten points to a front where I can't possibly double advance yet. I can only prepare by moving into Nomahan. To invade Manchuria, I have to declare war on Japan, and that has to be discussed and agreed on by everyone at a conference. Maybe next time. At least I'm in position now, and the Red Army got to move both fronts this turn. Ops, I forgot the British thrust in the Mediterranean theater. I've got eight strength remaining. And wow, a ten total failure. Wow. Italy keeps me out of North Africa by themselves in January 43. Finally, Japanese Army in Burma. The IJA nerfs one of my offensive support. Eight or less again to advance. Seven, just barely. Japanese armies will redeploy next turn. No one picked up any victory points from fighting this turn. At the end of the turn, here's the VP track. Britain, two times two clean colonies. Plus three, because MacArthur hasn't returned. Plus three clandestines equals ten points. Stalin leads with 16, 3 because MacArthur hasn't returned, plus 2 clandestines, plus 5 times 1 conference wins, plus 3 times 1 points from the nuke spy, plus 3 points because no USA bomb. The US is really far back at 2, but they have more opportunity to score points later in the game, so that's fair. Stalin will have to be careful not to get too far ahead, or whoever's in second place, currently Churchill, will be winning the game. Regardless of who's ahead, however, remember, when, if ever, you tune in next time, I will lose twice. Doom, 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 do